So our next speaker um, is Victoria Basham, um, who's a senior lecturer in politics at the University of Exeter, and you can see that she's got a very different take on this as well. Um, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, when Tamara emailed me, I thought, yes, please, can I? Because I felt for the last ooh, a couple of years I've been looking roughly and sort of toying with the idea of interrogating or investigating something called the military ethos, which some of you may be familiar with, and if you're not, I'll talk a bit more about it. Um, and thought, I'm not an educationalist, and I've never been a teacher either. So, <coughs> and I'm talking about education on the fringes, albeit on the fringes, but, but I'm talking, I guess, about the politics of education. And so I felt very much an, the imposter, not really uh, speaking to the experts, as it were. So forgive me if some of this sounds kind of uh, like uh, sucking eggs or controversial <laughs> or whatever, but this is me as a, as a scholar of politics who sort of actually a kind of sociologist in disguise, uh, working in a po politics department because they had jobs. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, forgive me if it kind of comes across uh, differently to what you might expect, but I guess uh, I'm, I'm very interested in interdisciplinary dialogue, so that's where I'm sort of trying to come at it from. I'd also like to preface what I'm about to say with uh, a sort of caveat, if you like. I'm not trying to suggest uh, either that soldiers are robotic automaton uh, creatures who are socialised into you know, killing. That isn't quite, it's a bit more complicated than that and I know because I hang out with them a lot. Um, and also, uh, I don't want to suggest that there aren't individuals who happen to have once been soldiers or are currently soldiers who might be thinking about a teaching career. I don't want to suggest that they couldn't be marvellous at that. Uh, that's not what I'm about to sort of say. So I just wanted to kind of uh, preface it with that in case anyone thought I was about to do some soldier bashing. Uh, it's, uh, hopefully it's a bit more nuanced. Um, and also, I think there's some interesting stuff here. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're interested in structure and agency. That's a tension I'm having with trying to think through some of these things because there are various ways in which structure seems to fall out, largely social structure and inequality. Uh, but there's also some interesting ideas about how structures, the military institution, uh, can be this marvellous thing for individuals. Uh, so there's some really in sort of interesting debates about the extent to which structure and agency are interacting. So maybe that's something we could talk about subsequently. But anyway, um, what I want to do is question, if you like, the military ethos. Um, in 2012, um, the then Education Secretary, Michael Gove, who I've heard teachers love, right? He was, <laughs> he was great. He went down really well, yeah? He introduced government plans uh, to promote and put considerable resources, I'd say con pretty considerable resources, into various initiatives as part of the government's agenda to entrench something called the military ethos in British children's lives. Now, Michael Gove claimed that every child can benefit from the values of the military ethos. Self-discipline and teamwork, I'm quoting him here, are at the heart of what makes our armed forces the best in the world and are exactly what all young people need to succeed, right? Brilliant. Okay. All children, uh, self-discipline, teamwork, that's what we should be prioritising. That's apparently what our armed forces are all about. So among its various uh, military ethos initiatives, the uh, current government have awarded roughly 11.85 million for setting up 100 new cadet schools, uh, cadet units, specifically in state funded schools, which I find interesting. I'm currently doing a pilot project, small scale pilot project, uh, where I'm going out interviewing cadets and asking them uh, who are attached to these, in these attached units, state schools, you know, if, if the military ethos is wonderful and they're becoming better members of their community and that kind of thing. I can talk about that subsequently as well. There's been about 8.2 million uh, at least, uh, there possibly, possibly more for veteran-led alternative provision schemes um, for underperforming pupils in schools, kind of language, um, and around 10.1 million for the fast tracking of veterans, uh, some of whom don't have uh, initial degrees through teacher training in two years with a paid salary from the government through something called Troops to Teachers which has kind of gone off the radar recently, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Again, hmm, what's happening there? Um, and by the way, the, the cadet uh, goal was 100 new uh, cadet units by 2015. We're now in 2015. I think we're at about 65. So they're just over halfway, which is intriguing. 
Now, the military ethos, I would say, is generally poorly defined, uh, certainly by the government and government documents. But I think what it's broadly getting at or referring to is that there's certain values and qualities that are somehow inherent to the military, to military personnel and veterans, um, as a direct result of their kind of military socialisation and service, and that this somehow makes them ideally placed to uh, be involved in schooling. So there's an interesting connection being made there. There's very little evidence or even explanation as to why uh, a military ethos is good for British children, though, and that's kind of what I'm interested in, I guess. Indeed, um, there was a t uh, 2014 uh, Department for Education paper uh, entitled School Behaviour and Attendance, uh, Research Priorities and Questions, and this claimed that uh, military ethos organisations this is a quote, while still operating in a relatively immature market, will nonetheless be making tangible differences to pupils' education. Not they are, they, but they will. You know, they just will. We'll just take your word for it. They'll be addressing, they will be addressing behaviour difficulties and instilling values of teamwork and discipline, providing structure, organisation and boundaries and developing pupils' self-esteem and confidence. But then it goes on to say that the impact of military ethos interventions on the attainment, behaviour and attendance of pupils needs to be assessed. So there's an assumption here, again, that it's, it is just an inherently good thing. So in short, yeah, they're a good thing, but there's little evidence of actually if they actually are or why they might be. Um, so what I want to suggest uh, in this paper, contrary to the government's claims about the value of instilling military values and um, ethos in our schools, is that we ought to be vigilant about these initiatives, not necessarily completely dismissive, but vigilant, questioning. Uh, and the claims that are being made about them, because I think they do have some potentially interesting effects, not only on children, who are very important, but on wider British society as well. So I'm going to begin with four key points, and I'm going to try and do them as quickly as I can, um, on why, as a researcher of the armed forces and civil military relations, I have a problem, if you like, with the idea that military values and practices should become part of children's lives and then move on to consider uh, the potential of military ethos sh initiatives to disproportionately target some of the most vulnerable children in our society. And I use that word vulnerable, I want to problematise it, but you'll get a sense of what I'm getting at there. And its capacity, I think, to reinforce uh, and re-entrench wider inequalities, both in, in, in the education system and wider society. And that's kind of my real bug there, I think, with this. And then I'll end on a couple of reflections, because I'm a politics person, on why I think military ethos uh, initiatives are being pushed so hard at this particular time, um, the wider political context, and how children have kind of got caught up in that, if you like. Um, so, I'm sorry if I'm racing through too much. Is that? Yes, I think that's gone. All right, so in statements on the military ethos, uh, the military is frequently characterised in a particular way. It's uh, a disciplined organisation, and it, it's somewhere where values like loyalty, hard work, courage, self-sacrifice and commitment are routinely promoted and you know, performed. Now, in suggesting that veterans as a group are uniquely well-placed to contribute to schooling, there seems to be an assumption here, as I've sort of said, that military personnel who fight and sometimes die as well, have higher values and standards um, than civilians who do not kind of routinely face those kinds of risks. So there is something about the military being of a kind of different register or moral order here. But the notion that military service and the potential sacrifices it entails uh, should somehow be seen as different or of a higher register, if you like, does need to be questioned. And I would suggest that there are four main reasons for that. Firstly, for centuries, the British military have politically wielded this idea that they have a need to be different from the society that they serve uh, because of their role in wielding state-sanctioned violence. Um, so the idea here is that military, the military and its personnel have a different, they have a less individualistic, this is the kind of language you hear from the military quite a lot, less individualistic, more traditional set of values uh, that should be protected. This is what has historically allowed the army uh, and other parts of the armed forces to exclude ethnic minorities from certain uh, units, regiments, until about the mid, the mid to late 1970s. It's what the military broadly have used to justify the exclusion of sexual minorities from the military until 2000, when they were forced to do it by legislative change. Uh, they said homosexuality was incompatible with life in the armed forces and service values, essentially. Um, it's what 
has allowed the military to marginalise women, gain a dispensation from s the Sexual Discrimination Act that means that women are still excluded from close combat roles on the vague grounds of operational effectiveness. So these values in and of themselves need to kind of, they, they ought to be questioned, I think. So the military ethos, I would suggest, has lo long been one of exclusion and intolerance, uh, as, much, uh, as much of my other research shows. There's ongoing legacies of this uh, within the military, endemic sexual harassment, pitiful representation of ethnic minorities, and a culture of heteronormativity and closetedness within the armed forces. Secondly, it's been shown that those who've undergone military socialisation offer encounter significant harms, not goods. Um, for example, over half of UK military personnel surveyed in a recent study uh, perceive not just harm to themselves, but perceive that their military career was having a negative impact on their children. Um, though the reasons for that included things like uh, long and recurrent deployments and hardships brought about by divorce, separated, widowed, mental health problems, um, and so on, uh, probable post-traumatic stress disorders were also associated by military personnel with the idea that a military career has a negative impact on children. So there was there were sort of direct links between things that were specific to being in the military and this impact on kids. Uh, excessive consumption of alcohol, it's been in the press quite recently again, in the Brit British military, very common, uh, it's much higher than the general population. Service men in particular are likely to be uh, to drink twice as much uh, alcohol as their civilian male counterparts. Um, I mean, when it's you know, you're in a mess and it's a pound a pint, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and I've been drinking with soldiers and it, it gets messy, um, really messy. And there's been correlations that have been found between acts of violence by military personnel and returning home and their holding combat roles. So there are all these ways in which, you know, ha being in the military it can be dangerous to, to individuals and communities and people around military personnel. Thirdly, it's really unclear to me as to how loyalty, self-discipline and motivation have somehow become exclusive to military and, uh, and ex-military personnel. There's an endless list of individuals as well as identifiable kind of occupational groups who inculcate such values. Police officers, social workers, doctors, nurses, charity and aid workers, journalists, and dare I say it, even teachers, perhaps. Um, and as the military sociologist Mar Morris Janowitz has also pointed out, though the military can be seen as, uh, quote, a complete style of life, any profession, quote, which performs a crucial life and death task, such as medicine, develops these claims. So why the military? And finally, on this section, not quite finally uh, in the paper, we should, I think, at least ask if values such as discipline, obedience, conformity, acceptance of authority and hierarchy are what we want to stress in our schools or what we want to stress most in our schools, perhaps. So my, whilst all, this all might be conducive to education in some measure, are these what we value the most, if you like? Are these our kind of priorities? What about kind of questioning creativity and those sorts of things? Again, I'm not suggesting that soldiers are not questioning and creative as individuals, but these ideas about what values they have and should bring at least are saying it's these ones we want and those ones not so much. Um, and what are the implications for kind of citizenship and democracy uh, if our children are kind of socialised primarily along these sort of military ethos lines. What, what does the future look like when, you know, we're really old and grey and they have to pay for us? So I, I worry about that. Um, so, um, as I've already mentioned, uh, so I'm sort of going to move on to some of the kind of effects, uh, if you like, of, of military ethos or potential effects of the military ethos. Now, as I've already mentioned, evidence on the actual impact of the military ethos in children's lives is limited. There's a study from uh, 2007 that does suggest, uh, it does an analysis of veteran-led alternative provision schemes, and it suggests that it, can, it has some positive impact on attendance and behaviour, that wonderful euphemism we all love, in schools. However, as the study also noted, um, engaging in these alternative provision schemes uh, comes at some costs. Um, so what usually happens is, what they found is that students who participate in it typically drop a couple of GCSE subjects, um, which equate to a couple, about two and a half days of instruction, of academic instruction per week, uh, to focus on this alternative curriculum with veterans, uh, which includes things like residential trips, sports, outdoor pursuits, community environmental projects, some classroom work, they learn practical skills, number handling, uh, pay understanding payslips and bank statements, write <coughs> writing checks, checking change, and so on. 
Now, as the academic uh, Esther Dermot has argued in her, she's done a really interesting analysis of troops for, to teachers. She says, well, this encourages something that we've had in education for a long time, which is this idea of a two-track model, where whilst the majority of children are seen to be in need of these teachers that have got this expertise and subject knowledge, academic, you know, encouragement, etc., there's this minority that need discipline. Discipline de delivered by authoritarian role models, and that this, for Derma, is what you know, veteran-led provision is kind of pushing. Now, given that many children who are referred for alternative provision come from some of the most uh, socio-economically deprived backgrounds, um, simplistic assumptions about the suitability and unsuitability of certain children for different academic and disciplinary paths that these military eth uh, ethos initiatives are relying on, I think really do risk re-entrenching socio-economic divisions and prejudices and obscuring kind of more structural inequalities. Um, also, when children are typically dropping to GCSEs to go on these outdoor pursuit things, things like going camping overnight, being given ration packs to spread over 24 hours, learning to cook, put up tents, carry out first aid, walk 15 miles in two days. Uh, these are all things that these, these veteran-led alternative provision schemes deliver. They're picking up interesting skills, um, skills that are especially conducive to a military career and that are coming at the expense of formal qualifications. Now, I'm not suggesting that participating in veteran-led alternative provision will cause children uh, to enlist. I'm not being that simplistic about it. But it might make military service and the role of the military in wider life and our support for it just that little bit more kind of desirable and possible, a bit more appealing. Given that alternative provision may displace the pursuit of traditional qualifications, entry, uh, but, but sorry, but given that um, alternative provision may display, the p may sort of come at the expense of pursuing formal qualifications, if those kids did decide that they wanted a to go into a, the military, some of them, that entry into the armed forces would very likely be at the lowest ranks because there's a two-tier system. If you have qualifications, you can go in higher. If you don't, you go in as the, you know, euphemistic cannon fodder, right? Um, now, those roles at the very bottom are generally more hazardous. 87% of British soldiers killed in Afghanistan and Iraq between 2001 and 2012 belonged to the other ranks. They were not officers, right? Ones that don't have qualifications. That's where they're concentrated. The infantry, though only a small part of the overall army, has suffered the highest fatality rates in Afghanistan. It's a far more popular destination for school leavers than adult enlistees, so the youngest like the idea of going off and run into the infantry. It's all male, the infantry, at this point. Um, and uh, soldiers who had joined uh, in a study uh, done by um, members of Forces Watch, um, who are an interesting organisation that I can talk to you a bit more about as well, um, in a study they did, they found that um, soldiers that joined the army at age 16 were approximately 50% more likely to die as a consequence of deployment to Afghanistan than those who listed as adults. So there's an issue here about under 18s joining the military as well. And so s more veterans in schools is ringing alarm bells for me in that sense. Um, so the military's two-tier entry system uh, that it has, moreover, not only sustains pre-military class or socioeconomic inequalities, but it also entrenches them. It ensures, uh, and there's interesting studies that show this, that soldiers re-enter the labour market with skills for low status jobs. Officers re-enter it with skills geared towards higher status positions. There are exceptions to that, but that's the general trend. So military ethos initiatives might be framed as the solution to the problem of underperforming kids, but they're risking reinforcing this two-track education system that individualises success and failure and overlooks structural barriers and makes it, I think, just that little bit more possible that our wars might, be conti might continue to be fought by society's most vulnerable members. OK, so finally, final section. How am I doing for time? OK, that's fine. I've, I can do that. Um, so, uh, and the reason why this, mine, this one step forward uh, piece is here is, there's, you might have seen some press on this, really interesting, that Britain's the only country uh, uh, in the European Union and the UN Security Council that uh, still recruits minors 
Um, so everyone else over 18, uh, we're in like a list with, you know, regimes that are we probably don't want to be in lists with, as it were, um, for recruiting child soldiers. And there's a, a judicial review being carried out currently uh, on this issue. There's quite a lot of parliamentary debate going on about raising the age of recruitment to 18. Um, the MOD a couple of years ago conceded that, all right, we won't deploy under 18s, except in exceptional circumstances, and we can't tell you about those because of the security reasons. So, um, but, you know, uh, uh, under 18s have died uh, in warfare, uh, famously or infamously in the, in the Falklands, for example, uh, four seven, well, three 17-year-olds and a kid who just turned 18 that day um, were killed in the Falklands War. Okay, um, so why now? Why uh, the military ethos? Um, I'm a politics scholar, so what is the kind of wider politics of this? Um, although I'm very interested in the politics of every day, so I'm, I'm not really. Uh, but um, so as I've suggested, uh, why, where, um, so if, as I've suggested, uh, why, when military ethos initiatives, if you like, pose an, a number of potential kind of problems for children and society, and indeed their benefits are so unclear or under-researched, um, are the government kind of um, keen to promote them? Aside from kind of really basic ideological reasons and personality-based reasons, you know, let's blame Michael Gove. I mean, we, we should blame Michael Gove. But um, yeah, but I've got three kind of suggestions that I think we should also maybe think about. So firstly, as good old Esther Dermot has argued, uh, again, military ethos initiatives very much need to be situated into this wider uh, political and social context where there's increasing concern over both general standards in UK education and much more specific worries about the educational attainment of boys and let's forget about the girls kind of thing or vis-a-vis -vis girls. Girls are doing really well, boys must be doing terribly. One of the solutions to these kind of concerns that's been much touted for consideration, as you will know more about than I do, is the perceived decline in education of attainment of boys. Well, oh, maybe it's because they need more male role models, right? Get blokes into classrooms, male teachers, etc. Now, as men constitute 90% uh, of the UK armed forces, regular armed forces, the likelihood is that ex-service men will dominate these military ethos schemes. Um, and as a report on troops to teachers by the Centre for Policy Studies, they're a right-wing think tank founded by Sir Keith Joseph and Margaret Thatcher in 1974 and still going strong, um, they, they asserted, well, this is a really good thing, um, especially uh, for what are somewhat euphemistically labelled in a report that they put forward as kind of inner city schools where this wonderful quote from Tom Burkhard comes, ex-servicemen could have a profound effect on discipline and learning. This is not merely because ex-servicemen are sure of their own moral authority. Um, they are not intimidated by adrenaline fueled adolescence. They have, unlike most teachers, been there before. Um, and to me, this kind of echoes that sort of uh, what we need to do <coughs> with, you know, kids like that who wear hoodies who are obviously terrifying they're all in gangs so we swap their disorganized violence for organized yeah. violence <laughs> and stick them in a boot camp of the military i don't know this we turn their shame uh, on their humiliation into pride for their country so there's some, there's some interesting things going on there um, as well as, of course, essentialising masculinity and femininity. You know, men will sort out boys and women can sort out, you know, girls. And overlooking the needs of girls as well. The assumption here is that military ethos initiatives will give these wayward youths kind of better life choices, right? It will enable individuals to do the right thing. And this allows, again, I think, for the insulation of wider society from its reproduction in the very structural inequalities that constitute, constitute poverty, gender inequalities, and so on in the first place. We can just deal with the problem and not have to worry about the complexity. Secondly, I would argue that military ethos initiatives are a, a, around at the moment because they aim to build popular support for the military in a very particular context of global recession. Uh, according to the Royal British Legion, unemployment among 18 to 49 year old British veterans is often around twice that of the national average. You've got a lot of people, high profile in the media, coming back from places like Afghanistan, not able to get jobs. Uh, the Troops to Teachers programme actually began in the United States. Uh, it was initially set up by the Clinton administration to provide veterans of the first Gulf War with employment. And I don't think it's uh, 
a complete coincidence that the launch of Troops to Teachers has coincided with similar unemployment issues among veterans, plus military redundancies, uh, drawdowns, etc., um, which are affecting these high-profile people who've served. Um, so I think Troops to Teachers uh, particularly, and some of these other military ethos schemes, um, serve a political, uh, an important political function for a government that's under pressure to be seen to be doing something for veterans as well. So it's, it does have an a, a effect there. Um, it helps that government to be seen to be doing something, but something that does very little to address unemployment and disadvantage among veterans, and of course that also diverts attention from the wider economic and political reforms that are probably needed for job growth for everybody, uh, including some of these guys, right? Um, finally, and this really is the final section now, I mean it, uh, I think military in ethos initiatives are all kind of everyday practices that rely on the idea uh, that the military isn't just great, but it's a core, inevitable and socially valuable institution in our society. So much so that it should play this key role in our children's lives and upbringing. Now, there are many non-military youth groups who claim to successfully promote cooperation, social responsibility, wonderful values amongst kids, but it's not them but cadet forces that are getting uh, and their military ethos that are attracting large-scale government support. And if you look at the funding for youth initiatives, it, it is highly disproportionate in favour of cadets versus everybody else, basically, who's working with youth, doing youth work. Uh, though there's a number of non-graduates who may potentially be amazing teachers, they're not being supported by the government fast-tracked in the same way. They're not being given the same sort of grants, etc. And though, and as, as I've sort of said, though all manner of people in our society uh, believe in hard work, loyalty, courage, commitment, and to helping children to develop values and so on, including of course teachers, um, it's only veterans and military personnel and organisations that are being heralded really as the solution to society's supposed ills. Um, so I think military ethos initiatives aimed at children may be making it harder to promote non-military ways of being and doing, uh, and therefore need to be questioned. I think the great risk of all this is that as the military becomes more normalised in our society, so too does military violence as a commonsensical approach to global issues. So I think there's a wider geopolitics of the everyday here. Uh, British children are therefore one and one especially important section of the population who've perhaps become the target of practices that are reproducing the UK uh, and its warfare practices more widely. And seeing as, like I said, uh, there are problems there around young people and military recruitment. Who fights and dies those future wars troubles me greatly. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry if I sped through as well. I've got a propensity to pack too much in and babble. So. Can I just ask, when you say, um, when they, when the government talk about... Mm. Um, military personnel, presumably they mean ex-officers, I mean they don't mean... No, no, they mean, they yeah, mean yeah okay. absolutely, and I mean a lot of the, um, I mean I don't have the statistics, but uh, from what I've seen, uh, a number of the people that run a lot of these veteran-led alternative provision things, yeah. people like Skills Force, Commando Joes, that kind of thing, um, would prob a lot of them will be like the senior NCO, non-commissioned officers, so like the sergeants and things like that. Um, so yeah, and it, you know, it's Private Jones as well, etc. So everybody. Yeah. Do you wanna? Yeah. Hello. Um, <coughs> I've got all sorts of things to talk about <laughs> at some point. Um, I should probably explain <coughs> I'm a uh, I'm an ex minister basically quite a left wing liberal teacher, <laughs> twenty years of experience in uh, so sorry, ten, uh, eight years of experience of teaching in a council school. Uh, I'm also a member of the Royal Naval <coughs> Reserve. Mm -hmm. I suspect I'm the only person in the military or the services in the room. I'm not sure if that's <laughs> So uh, that perspective may be a, may be of assistance. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I was always very sceptical of the Troops to Teachers uh, scheme. And that was principally because uh, in my professional practice, uh, the disciplinary model mm. models are different, or the, the, the ideas of, of relating to people are different. And uh, that came, that was always been clear to me, and it was crystal clear when I returned from Iraq and then after a period of leave had to teach drama to year nine. <laughs> um, and it was the, the contrast from being in an environment where 
I, I asked for something and it happened. Mm. <laughs> to, to John, to you and I. Yes. <laughs> uh, and also, so it's their size mm -hmm. and, and their ex sort of. So I, I remember at the moment when I had them and I said, You're very short. In my head, I went, You're all very short and you're very badly behaved. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's, like, there's loads of stuff uh, to, 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 to talk about mm. that you presented. And, uh, it's, it's some critical stuff. So first of all, your presentation about um, uh, the forces as they currently are it included things like presenting it as a some of the stuff about sexuality. I, d I think I think that should be challenged mm. because there's now quite a lot of work about diversity, sexual diversity in the services, certainly in the navy. Mm. And of course, there's the difference between what was the official position and what really happened which mm. is a, a rich and, and fascinating gay history, you know, mm -hmm. LGBT his element of history. Um, the most useful thing I think I can throw in, and, and there's, there's other stuff that may come up, was I, I've asked myself, what is it about this government that makes them want to use the service personnel, people like me, or, or, or I mean, I'm a, a reserve, so I've always been a reserve, but the regular, what is it, why do they do that? Um, and my associations to that, uh, I'm also interested in psychoanalytical theory, which makes me very unusual as a leptic <laughs> commander in the Royal Navy Reserve. Um, there's a fantasy um, that's being deployed, like a, a fantasy of obedience, a fantasy mm, of absolutely, uh, delivery. Yeah. You know, you, mm -hmm. the, the, the standard, um, uh, I've forgotten the name, uh, the name of the German theorist, you know, the, the, the arms, the armed bureaucrats. Uh, they deliver stuff, mm. we do stuff, mm. they say we do it, and in fact that, was, that is the reality, the most extraordinary things happen because they, we have received orders. Um, that fantasy is at play in the way that the state talks about education, so there's something about the relationship between the, the, the state education system mm. and other forms, of, uh, other forms of violence. I mean, us, using that we could say there are other forms of violence being executed within the education system. Mm. Uh, but not, and we also in uniform, in a different sort of uniform. Um, but the sort of political element of that is also that the way that the current government has used the services um, rhetorically masks uh, what's happened in reality mm -hmm. in the services. Mm. So that your, your first slide said, why are the best armed forces in the world? I'm afraid that's no longer true. Mm. Uh, and that is, that is no longer true as a direct consequence of... of decisions that are being made by this government, uh, among others. Mm. Um, so I think there, there's also a sense in which they're using the services in education mm -hmm. to protect uh, or to veneer um, reality, mm. uh, real decisions about international affairs and, uh, and the services. Uh, and just to underline that, I'd love to know what the numbers are actually around the recruitment of those cadet forces and the recruitment of those troops and teachers, because their, their experience probably would have been like mine, but without the resources to deal with it. When they get into a classroom, they go, what is this? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, but it's also a story about those targets being consistently missed. So there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a whole load of targets about recruitment into the services and into the reserves, which have been spectacularly missed. Uh, and that's all about driving budget cuts. Uh, and, I, and it's the same mm. time it's been used. Mm. Thank you. No, thanks. That, that's not just a stretch, is it? That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, to that point, in a way, um, reading between the lines, and, and you would be best placed to have read between the lines because you've been delving into it, um, and also yourself, actually, Andrew. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be alarmist or anything, I'm just asking the question mm. is this troops to teachers and cadet cadetization <laughs> of young people? Um, a uh, mechanism to create a ground force, what's the word, <laughs> for the future. I mean, I recently watched Bitter Lake, and it would seem, if you've seen that film, it's a good one, and if you haven't, it suggests that the world's gone to pop. Um, so I wonder if somebody somewhere, or a bunch of people somewhere, have thought, gosh, things are getting tricky out there. Maybe we need to create a kind of forward-thinking plan about young people who are ready to be called up. Hmm. And, and is this cadets stuff to prepare us for what they worry might be future conflict? Do you want me to 
Shall I respond yeah, to, to both? Okay, I think it's more nuanced. I think the actual kind of, um, but I think we should keep that in mind. I think it's an important question to keep in mind. I think uh, when, I mean, some of the stuff that's done on cadets sort of shows, that, you know, and actually an uh, officer training corps as well is a really interesting um, piece of work that's been done by pe uh, scholars, colleagues at Newcastle University on that. You know, this sort of thing of, well, you know, people uh, join the cadets, they join the OTC, they, you know, room for a few years. It's just a way of accessing experiences, adventure training, etc. They wouldn't otherwise through other means, which raises questions about why they can't through other means without the guns. Um, but um, you know, ultimately, not many. It doesn't convert. So there's no kind of clear causal link there as such. But I think these things all need to be thought about in the context of a broader kind of set of issues around things like Armed Forces Day, community covenants, ways in which the military have kind of uh, been sold by the government and uh, in a way that sort of normalises or, you know, support for the armed forces. Now, one of the problems with that is that actually, uh, you know, there are questions there for those of us who are concerned about kind of creeping militarism, which I am, but I also work with the armed forces, so I'm also interested in what the potential effects for them are. And uh, this is where, you know, the thing about unemployment, you know, um, you know, diverting attention from injuries, you know, those things that make them the state, you know, people question what the state's doing with its armed forces. I, you know, if we're all there waving our flags at, you know, the modern armed forces day, perhaps we think a little bit less about those things. But yeah, I mean, we're moving this whole restructuring the armed forces uh, to this whole force concept uh, where you've got a, a higher, uh, or at least an aim to recruit more reservists, um, which is at the moment not doing terribly well. It's another failing target. And I'm actually doing a project on the reserves. So I'd be interested <laughs> to talk to you about that. I was at Army HQ just yesterday for that. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of kind of, it's, I think it's quite a complex situation, but I think your question is one that I always would want to keep there in the back of my mind, just in case, because it's not that I think there's a clear link, but it could get a bit easier. Um, and I think that's why there's something to be not alarmed about, but just to be mindful of maybe. Um, yeah, and I don't know, I was just, yeah, the fantasy of obedience uh, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I've done research extensive. I've been doing this for over a decade with military personnel, and that's why I prefaced the they're not robots kind of comment. Um, yeah, I mean, and there's all sorts of ways in which within the military, soldiers buck discipline and trends and all sorts of things. So, yeah, this idea that you can package them and sell them to schools, as it were, and that that will just have the magic effect is kind of bizarre. Um, but my point is also about the effect it has an idea, our, our idea about what a school should be. Yes, no, absolutely, yeah, no, absolutely, and that is one of my concerns, of course. Um, and the sexual orientation thing, I'll talk to you, I've done extensive research on that, so we can talk about that, but, yeah. Can I take a couple of, uh, two, we've got three, then one, two, three. <coughs> There's a sort of rise on the number of year seven students that are excluded across London and in the before, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm just, I, I, I wonder if the sort of teaching style that is considered good to outstand them in primary doesn't really chew people across the secondary mm. because that sort of fantasy of obedience is translating into what a good teacher is and the more punitive you are it seems the better you are as a teacher and the mm. more you're rewarded as a teacher and the, and the greater your reputation seems to be across the school as the, as, as the, as the expert that can deal with the mm. tough one but the difficulty is the fallout is a high number of exclusions both within school mm. and without the school. And, and I don't know if it's a, and, and actually I'm thinking about the sort of teach first model mm. that has got a very punitive mm. approach mm. to behavior that seems to be within this sort of ethos is, is, is what is uh, being churned out as a good teacher. And it's creating a sort of binary between soft and hard mm. teachers, good and bad teaching. Mm. And I don't know if, you, if there's a link between this mm. and, and that sort of approach to teaching that's fetishized now. Mm. Great. Mm. Is there well, a... I, ask yeah. I was at... Well, I invited Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> it's precisely I thought you said that's when you just asked her. No, 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 <laughs> it's why I invited Victoria. It was, that was exactly the, my line of mm. reasoning yeah. that, that led me to find her. Yeah, because mm. so there's a recruitment drive 
similar to what you mm. were sort of implying with Teach First, into huge multinational corporations. Right. You've got these contracts mm. with these academy chains. Mm. And so you either burn out, you stay, or you become a really tough person mm. that, that steps out of the classroom quickly, and that tough punitive <coughs> manifests in policies and how schools are. Mm. Mm. OK, know. let's take a couple mm. more. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the primary to secondary school move. I think this is just another example of a way of creating these children as something we need special people to deal with mm -hmm. that's beyond the normal teacher's remit. And in primary school, there's less of that, but it's still it's, it's moving more to be a specialised process. But once you get into secondary school, these young people are pushed into nurture groups and things. And the experiences that they get through the military ethos type things are also the same sorts of experiences they get through residentials, mm. school-based residentials with the teachers that teach them every day that show generally quite positive um, behavioral outcomes. And one of, the, one of the really nice quotes that came back from somebody, I can't remember who I heard talking at a conference once, about one of the children had been talking to him in his research. And the child said, I don't much like school and I don't like the work, but now I trust my teacher and he tells me it's important, so I'm going to do it because he says it's a good idea. And that kind of relationship building that goes on in mm -hmm. these residential things. If it's soldiers that are delivering it that are not part of the main school of its alternative provision, then they're not this is a, an exclusionary practice, yeah. not an inclusionary yeah. practice. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna make a, just a very similar point about I think for me too teachers is significant in, in that it's part of a, a bigger discursive shift about what it means to be a teacher mm. and that this we've seen under this government that we you know to move away from any kind of um, university-based training, um, you know, it's far more about these people who can do it, mm. you know, are for reasons to be authoritative and so on, and it, um, it's, to me, it's just part of that, of that bigger shift, um, and I think there's a very interesting gender dimension to that, mm. which basically says, you know, the reason why some of these children aren't behaving in schools and there are problems is that there are all these young women teaching them, mm. and that's the, the mm. issue. Mm. It basically says it's about having these men and tell them what to do. Mm. Um, which I think hasn't, yeah. You know, there's a, there's bigger issues about shifting what it means to be a teacher and a good teacher. Mm. But for me, there's particularly worrying, given mm. how gendered the workforce is. Mm. The teach first rhetoric is war based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the language is fascinating. Mission. Mm -hmm. mission. You're on a mission. Yeah. You've got to survive. You're in it. You're in the front line. Mm. And often we have to unpick all of that when we receive teachers. And actually. It's like you're de-radicalizing them. To, 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 I'm being serious. <laughs> yeah, we have to um, we have to get rid of all of that stuff to be able to put them in a classroom and be successful. Mm -hmm. So it's, crea it's creating a huge amount of work for schools to retrain people out of this mm -hmm. psychotic episode that they're turning out. Any other mm -hmm. thoughts, comments, questions? I was just thinking as well. I think I think that vocabulary is interesting. Regimented certainly is the word that brings me. Yeah, brings me. Um, just to say, I mean, I think I'm um, just it's fascinating. This is why I wanted to come because I thought, you know, <laughs> sort of stabbing around it, you know, walking around and struggling around in the dark. But yeah, I mean, um, I think that's really interesting. I, my question when you sort of raise these things about this punitive language and pun was, is there a gender component? I bet there is, kind of thing, because I can imagine it's all too easy to kind of, yeah, to constitute it as you know, over statistical dominance of women in certain roles, but also, 
I wonder if there's more informal stuff around, you know, the, the, the very strong, firm woman teacher and how, you know, she's perceived as a bull buster or whatever. Yeah, well, yeah, it's quite, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, fascinating in terms of identity. And, yeah, what, I mean, for me, this was the kind of question I kind of came to, but didn't, and another reason why I really wanted to come today, because I just thought, well, what, what do we actually want in schools? And what, what do we want teachers to look like and do? Because all of these things, I'm not sure, you know, that's not what I thrived on when I was at school, and, you know, when I was at school. But, you know, is that what we're after? And indeed, is it what even gets delivered, as it were? Is it even what these people can bring? Um, so yeah, there's uh, some really interesting kind of issues around there, and I'll, yeah, the Teach First stuff. I have seen some of those adverts and thought, ooh, uh, ooh, uh, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, something to look at a bit yeah, more yeah. as well. This was the mm. I, could, I train new qualified teachers <coughs> as part of the central training packet, and I can always tell a Teach First teacher by their attitudes and behaviours, and I and I work in SEM. So they are very punitive and quite, you know, it's the single mothers. It's that their mm. deficit thinking is quite extraordinary because mm. they're taught to fight, it mm. feels like. Yeah. So right, but also because they're not stagnant. taught. There's no time in their six weeks or whatever before they get into school to have any no. other uh, kind of education about the world or the concepts they're going into. You know, but they're just taught how to manage the classroom, basically, aren't they? And get across some of the subject. Yeah. And um, so I don't know, yeah. So well, I did a three strikes you're out to one of them and turned it on to him. He said, right, you're out of my classroom <laughs> and kicked him out. <laughs> and I said, how do you feel? Do you feel, how do you feel? Do you feel victimized? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's horrible. We have to do such extraordinary things <laughs> <laughs> to, to get rid of this thinking. Yeah. And I become this horrible bully person. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and I do think there's something interesting about I mean, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm not the expert, but about special interventions and needing to, you know, intervene, but intervene in very particular ways that seem to be quite narrow, narrowly conceived into certain kids' lives. In a, you know, that that I keep sort of coming back to that and thinking, hang on. Sorry. I'm in your, not in your eyeline. Um, have we got time to get you to talk a little bit about which kids? Because you talked, you did mention mm. the, the, polit the, the politicians' rhetoric around inner city schools, the euphemisms. But where are these? Where are these hundred cadet units? Which schools are taking these potential positions? Mm. So um, they're specifically targeted at state schools, the cadet forces. Um, a lot of those are academies, okay, though. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, and that's quite interesting because, the f and I'm, I'm at the early stages of this cadet project, but some of the stuff I've done around that is sort of, I've, I've spoken to a few cadet leaders and they're like, oh, this, this school's amazing, they've, you know, they've really turned these kids around in a pretty rough area and the cadets are continuing that mission, as it were. It's that kind of sort of language contributing to that transformation of the local area and, and the school. And, and, you know, these are schools who statistically you are looking at you know, you are looking at a transformation potentially with, you know, high attainment of grades and things like that. So, um, but I need to do a bit more of that mapping. Um, it would be interesting to know if they're in the traditional recruiting grounds for the army. Yeah, I mean, mm. a lot of the, so um, the Commando Joes and uh, Skills Force and groups like that, there's been quite, I mean, they're, they're everywhere to an extent, but there has been, they have done quite a bit of work in schools in, you know, urban centres, London, um, but also Newcastle, places like that, um, Norfolk. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, and there's some interesting work by f uh, Forces Watch on uh, where they've mapped out military visits to schools and how they, they're disproportionate in terms of the military traditional uh, recruiting grounds. So lots in Scotland and particularly mm. particular areas of Scotland as well. Um, there's also some interesting, th I'm, again, I'm still sort of mapping this out, but there's some interesting things about the sort of CCF model attached to private independent schools versus this. Um, so that's, sorry, that's the combined cadet force, um, which is what the, Government are sort of well. They're setting up army cadets and other force cadets as well, but most of them they're sort of aspiring would be combined cadet forces. But there's also, I think, I mean, 
uh, you know, my suspicion is there's one of the reasons why there's this aspiration is, well, look, you know, lots of independent schools, private schools have had a long uh, tradition of having a combined cadet, cadet force attached to them, you know, and uh, that's very good for these kids who go to these, you know, quite privileged schools and maybe that's what we need more of that in our state schools to compensate for, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so there seems to be something around that as well that's quite interesting. And uh, one, of, one of the kind of emergent things that I'm finding which is quite interesting is um, some of these state uh, cadet forces are struggling to get uh, adult volunteers to work with the cadets. Um, because what they'll often do is ask teachers and the teachers don't have the time because they're teachers and everything's crazy. Um, and they're working in a, you know, a school where things are hectic and you know, so on. And uh, um, one of these cadet sort of leaders, former uh, army infantryman said to me the other day, you know, well, the independent schools, you know, they can make it part of a teacher's contract that they'll lead the cadets. And so it makes our lives so much easier. And I thought, blimey, that's interesting. <laughs> um, do you know that that's what you're signing up to? You know, and, and some people will be perfectly happy with that, but other people might not. And then that career opportunity becomes, you know, rolled up with something they don't want to do. And so there's some interesting issues here around uh, the independent schools and their relationship with the cadets and what's happening in the state sector. The, 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 um, the CCF, when, when, I, when I was at school, <laughs> as we came off the arc, um, <coughs> I went to a comp, but the, the local independent school, they had, a, they had CCF, but you, and you signed up either for that or to do voluntary work. Mm. Yeah. But, so that's, that's the other half. And I, I was chairman of the local youth voluntary organisation. So I used to go in and do their assemblies. <laughs> and we used to recruit very well because lots of those kids didn't want to do CCM. Mm. But they had the option of doing community voluntary work instead, which was very highly structured. Yeah, I mean, there, there was lots of different things you could get involved with. But there's no, there's no alternative here now, is there? It's less CCM. so, yeah. It seems like there's less on offer. Yeah. Okay, while the sandwiches are preparing themselves, there were a couple of people who had their hands up a minute. Yeah. Um, I, I just think that the, the idea of obedience, whether it's a fantasy of obedience or whether it's taken on as an actual thing that mm. the military have to have to sign up for, it, it can be so dangerous and can be so destructive. I was talking to someone the other day who had been a Marine, and he was saying that um, he had a bad hip and it needed operating on. It had been operated on and he'd had a botched operation. But he refused to sort of question any of the medical services because they know what they're doing. There was no sort of question of him getting a second opinion or anything. So in fact, he was uh, you know, extremely disabled. But he, he felt it was, there was no question that he could do anything about it. Mm. He'd ask the question. And I was thinking about what you were saying about the numbers who are unemployed later. I'm wondering how much of that ethos affects uh, later employment. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's really interesting because I think what we're often told are the sort of success stories about go into the military and you'll get all these transferable yeah. skills and you'll learn a trade and so on. And then actually, when you look at the unemployment figures and what people come out with, and I mean, resettlement in the armed forces, at, at least in the army, is pretty ridiculous. You know, it's like a really, there's not much going on in, by way of support for veterans. So, you know, it, it, there is this real sort of disparity. And, and I think these values are quite interesting, not just obedience, actually. I mean, I remember interviewing um, a Royal Marine uh, myself a number of years ago who had had a sort of moment in his career where he was really unhappy in the Royal Marines for lots of different reasons. And he really wanted, to, he'd had an opportunity to sort of move into the army. So it wasn't that he was leaving the military, but he, he could change the ser his service. But to him, that was, you know, that would have been betrayal in the, fir you know, the highest order. So he stayed and was miserable for a really, you know, and had a lot of problems, personal and professional, as a result of staying because he felt that, he, you know, loyalty is one of those core values and that he would be undermining that if he made that switch. Mm. And it came at a cost to him and also his family and all sorts, you know, there's quite lots of complexities around it, but, yeah. Well, just following off on that, it, it, it occurs to me that um, the military might be rather attractive to young men who sort of were in my mind about maybe having struggles with their identity, sense of 
autonomy, strength, and that so to take on a military identity might solve one big problem they've got about how, how to present themselves as a strong, viable mm. individual, but leave alone probably the underlying difficulties. Mm. And if you're entering a culture that is actually rather macho and defensive in some ways, that's potentially disastrous because it will just strengthen that, 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 that the solution at the cost of not dealing with maybe some of the underlying mm. difficulties that they, they may have. So I'm thinking about you know, your figures on the rates of alcoholism and, mm. and et cetera, et cetera. Maybe it's, it's no wonder it isn't all well perhaps attracting the group with some, some problems, particularly the, as the younger recruitment. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It absolutely. also becomes a sort of fantasy family, I think, for them. Or can do for them. Yeah, I mean, f I think families are a really strong comp component for lots of people, but particularly young, you know, recruits. And there, there's quite a lot on that, at least anecdotally, that suggests that there might be a yeah, displacement of family there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think, yeah, absolutely, that, that kind of those social... And, of course, you know, PTSD is being um, explored more and more now, but it, for a long time it kind of... There wasn't... There was a bit of a dearth on it, and it'd be interesting to see, you know, what might be emerging around different age groups and, and length of service and, you know, so much like the sort of study on fatalities, you know, whether people joining young, there's any particularly um, interesting things about their experiences with PTSD and so I mean I don't have those things to hand but I suspect they're being done or they have been or they're about to be so um, it'd be interesting to see if there's any correlations there so yeah. Okay, great, thanks Victoria, a really illuminating session. Thank you.